Hello, everyone. Um, I want to welcome you to tonight's uh, Edwena and Charles Milner Women in the Arts Lecture Series. I'm Jill Winburn, the gallery director, and I'd like to introduce our first artist this year. Um, she's a super awesome person. <laughs> She has a huge fan club, as I can see, so that's really cool. Her name's Linda? Joanno. Joanno. <laughs> I always want to pronounce it the French way, so. Anyways, here she is. That's it? That's it. You don't have a longer introduction? So, am I on? Can you all hear me? Okay. All right. So, um, can you see the slides enough? Is it too bright in here? Turn the lights down. You, okay, so so Jason back there is slowly dimming the house lights for mood lighting. So um, first of all, I want to explain this photo because lots of people have always asked me about what's the deal with this. And um, I had a photographer friend named Anthony Scoggins who years ago, he was doing a lot of uh, photography with just regular film. And so what this was, this is one of my first work studios, and it was really a long and skinny studio. And this was at night. So what he did is he took the picture with a flash, and he was kind of in front of my studio. And so I'm posing with the torch, and he takes the picture with the flash, but then leaves the lens open. So I'm, I'm drawing with the torch. And initially, I was writing thank you cards. And I was standing at one side of my studio, working to the other, and I'm trying to write out thanks. And since it's a narrow studio, I, could, I couldn't get the whole word in. And he had 24 exposures. And what was happening is, is we kept trying, and it wasn't working out. And so and then it was close to Christmas, so I'm like, fine, I'll make a Christmas tree. So I made a Christmas tree, and I'm like, yeah, that's lame. So the very last frame of the, the film he had, I'm just like, you know what? I'm laughing, and I'm like, let's just make a smiley face. So that's what happened. And to just anybody who ever does uh, welding work, you know that you never wear shorts. This is totally staged. The, the dirt on my knees, staged. I, I never wear this sweater. I would never wear that sweater for working. And he's like, make the zipper lower, lower. And I'm like, come on, dude. <laughs> like, so, so anyways, that's, that's the, the whole story on that picture. So if you ever want to make a, a fun picture, that's how, you, that's how you do the light tracing thing. So, um, so I wanted to start out saying uh, early in my career, well, I shouldn't say, well, this is very early. Um, I started liking metal when I was in eighth grade, and I kind of knew it at the time, but there was a bunch of scary boys in the, the metal shop, and I'm like, I ain't going anywhere near there, because they're all making ninja stars and throwing them at each other. And, and you know, it wasn't the cool thing anyway to be a girl and be in that class. So, um, and then also we had a family friend, a very trusted family friend, who said you could never make a living as an artist so I just kind of took that to heart, and I tried all kinds of other jobs and, and went a completely different career path. I majored in marine geography from University of Hawaii, and then I went into Peace Corps in Ecuador for a while. And then out of Peace Corps, I went to LA, and I was doing those big foam walk-around costumes for the ice capades, and also for Disney and some cruise ships. So like, you know, if you ever go to Disneyland and you see those big foam costumes, and th that's what we were doing. So, um, and then also I thought it'd be kind of cool to be a tour guide. So I was a tour guide in Paris for a while and uh, doing bus tours primarily. And um, so my friend Colette had recommended to me to pretend like y'all are on a bus tour. So I just, <laughs> so keep your same seats because I'm not counting you again. Um, and the bathrooms are in the back. 
so, um, so I did bus tour for a couple of years in Paris and then uh, came back to LA. I was doing some window display work up in LA and then I came down to San Diego and was working for Nordstrom doing window display there. And um, then what happened, I was with my boss and we were setting up a big fashion show and we went to lunch and I saw this metal screen and I swear to you, it was like the light bulb going off, like in a cartoon. And it was, it just hit me like that. I'm like, my God, I have to do metal work. And growing up, my dad always did woodwork and we grew up on a farm. And uh, so I learned a bunch of tools and stuff like that, but I'd never done metal before. So, so that was kind of the light bulb moment. And then while I was at Nordstrom's, I thought, okay, fine, I'm gonna take a class in the morning and come to work a little bit later in the day. And I, I went to my boss and I said, you know, this is my plan and I'll just stay later. And then she said, no, you can't do that because in Nordstrom, the corporate world, you live, breathe and eat Nordstrom and that's just all there is to it. So, um, so then I found another class in the afternoon and I said, okay, fine, I'm coming in early and this is the class I'm taking, if you, and if you don't like it, you can fire me. And, and she was kind of snivelly, but then she agreed to it. So the class I ended up taking was night classes for two years, and it's this program for mostly for guys who have dropped out of school and need retraining, like they need to get certified in welding. And so um, it was just me, uh, one female in the class, and then all guys. And, but what it really encouraged me is my teacher told me that he was this, you know, grizzled up military guy, not like all military guys are grizzled up, but he'd been around. And, but he said, women make the best welders. And I took that to heart because he said, women are more meticulous and careful and conscientious. And I was like, that's cool. So he, we got along really, really well. He was a great guy. And, um, and what I kind of learned from when I first went into the metal class is um, I was very afraid of sparks and very afraid of things blowing up because I've had fireworks blasting in my face when I was a kid. So it was like I had to overcome a lot of fear. And I remember the first time I used a chop saw and I was talking to my friend on the phone that night. And I was like, oh my God, I used a chop saw. I can't even believe it. You know, there were sparks flying everywhere. And so it was, it was pretty cool. But I, but I definitely was motivated to learn the safety aspect of it. So I didn't hurt myself because also when you're self-employed, you're very much motivated not to hurt yourself because... If you hurt yourself, you're not making any income and nobody's paying you. So, well, that's redundant, but you know what I mean. So, so um, I wanted to learn it right. And when I started my welding class, I actually had bleach blonde hair. So I really stood out. And then one funny thing, when we were first learning, like you're sitting at little tables and you all got your little space. And I swear I smelt something burning. And I'm like, just really casually, like, back up, like, make sure I'm not on fire. And because I thought, I don't want to be the only girl in class with bleach blonde hair on fire, which <laughs> it wasn't me. It was somebody else. So, um, so the other things for doing metal is I learned that you really need to love it. It's like either you love it or you don't. And I had other female friends try the class because they're kind of like, well, if Linda can do it, I can do it. I think I'd like it. And, and then they tried it and they're like, hell no, this is like messy and dirty and, and loud. And it's kind of like either you get it or you don't. But if you get it, it's really super fun. And it just opens up a whole new world of, of um, just how things are made. I mean, I, I go into showrooms where they have bed frames and I'm crawling around on the floor to see how it's constructed because there's a lot of different ways to make a bed frame but the end of the day you don't want a bed frame that's jerking all over the place you want it solid so um, just real quick and the other jobs that I thought maybe I would like um, 
but I, for various reasons I never pursued. I would have liked to have been a surgeon. Um, later in life, I realized I would have enjoyed being a plumber. I, I thought briefly about being a herpetologist, which studies like reptiles and especially frogs. Um, I would have loved to have been a backup singer for the Stones. <laughs> and still, if they called me today, I'd be like, I can't sing, but I'm there. And then I would also would have liked to have been a drummer for Prince. But for various reasons, none of that panned out. So, so that's why I'm up here today talking about metal instead. Um, so let's see. And the last thing I think I need to say about, about the metal is, is I'll be referring to a plasma cutter. And for any of you that don't know, a plasma cutter, it, it works with electricity and an air compressor, and it gets the tip really super hot, and then basically the air, the compressed air, blows the two parts, like makes a cut and blows the two sides away. So, um, so you can make like really nice cuts with the plasma cutters. So, well, that's not the best slide to demonstrate it, but, but that's what a plasma cutter is. And I don't know why it's called that, but it just is. So, um, so anyways, let's look at a few slides here. So this is early me with my first truck. And, and this is one of the first things I had made for Nordstrom because once they realized I could weld, they were hiring me like every month. I was doing a lot of welding for Nordstrom. And it worked out really nicely because as they were paying me extra for welding, I was building up my inventory of tools and things. So it, it worked out nice. And the funny thing about this is I thought like, oh my god, this is so huge and everybody's going to be looking at me going down the road. Nobody could care. And this was in San Diego, and it was like, I didn't even exist. And then I realized, like, there's all kinds of crazy stuff going down the freeway, so. So, and then uh, for my first welding job, I worked at the Old Globe Theater, and I was in the props department. So I was like the welder in the props department. And how I got that job, I actually went to three different, the big three theater kind of places in town in San Diego. And I just went there for kind of an interview just to say, like, you know, I'm just checking out the place. And two out of the three offered me jobs. So, so but I just went with the Old Globe because they were, I could ride my bike to work. So, so but these are actually aluminum. They're just prop swords, but they were kind of fun. And they involved a lot of grinding, which when I first started welding, I was like all oh, into the grinder, and I thought it was the coolest thing ever. But, you know, it's good to learn <laughs> grinding, but um, it's messy and loud. So, and this is one of my first sculpture pieces that, it was small, but I liked it because the pieces in the middle swung. So I just thought it was kind of fun. Um, this, I don't know if you've ever seen the movie Blair Witch. This sculpture is actually about six and a half feet tall. And I saw Blair Witch on the opening day, and I sat there and looked at trees for two hours. And so I was inspired to make this. And I made a second one, too. This sold at a gallery. This was in a show, like, forever ago. And in my early days, for, for starting out, I did stuff for mostly, like, for galleries. I did group shows. You can show at the public libraries. They're always happy to have work. So um, this is not the most exciting thing, but it actually was an umbrella stand that I made for my dad. Anybody, if you're ever making stuff, you know your parents just love everything you make. <laughs> and, and, but the interesting thing to me was this was like technical to do. And it's, it's, it's kind of like a life-size boot. So, you know, and I patterned it after... Well, I don't have exactly a boot like that, but I kind of did. So, so anyways, that was why that's there. This is um, one of the earlier pieces I did. The reason why I'm standing there is just to give perspective, because those are giant boulders in the background. And the gate itself, I think, was about 13 feet across. And that was my old dog, Buddy, who was very helpful. And, and those are glass pieces that are um, that are kind of chunked in there in the gate. And, and interesting, too, the, the uh, sign 
that's on the right hand side their their address um, what's really cool is if you do aluminum in the background and then cut those numbers out that's with the plasma cutter you cut the numbers out and at night they reflect light so you don't actually have to have it electrified with a light on it you can just have aluminum it shows nicely um, this was some garden lollipops I did a uh, show kind of out in the boonies in San Diego like a big group show man these things sold like hotcakes and I don't if you ever like do a bunch of small stuff at a show I don't, there doesn't seem to be a rhyme or reason why people buy stuff I have no idea but I had a list of people that wanted to buy these things and the selling point was was you don't have to water them and they can be any heights you want so so people love them so um, this was another uh, early fence that I did and um, I my friend everything is like totally flammable there so she was she was off site with the hose the whole time like ready to squash out any flames and years later sadly that house actually burnt down I think the, the that survived the fire but I didn't burn it so and then the, the reason why I have this here is really funny because like right here in front is a big swimming pool and so what I, I started at the top and then I actually had to anchor myself on this boulder because because <laughs> because then what I was doing is bending the metal and welding and it's like I don't and I and I had a hammer drill making holes in the in the um, stone but but I didn't want to go falling into the swimming pool that would have been bad so this is um, an early screen that I did and the advantage of doing like a three-part screen and doing the hinge the way I did is when you have a floor that's uneven um, it, it finds its own balance which is really nice because hardly any floor is even and then I've repeated that design many times and what it is is just woven together but it's with a plasma cutter and um, but it just makes a cool thing it's like kind of organic it's kind of geometric and organic at the same time and I apologize for some of my pictures you kind of get the idea but but when they came off my website from little itty bitty small to big the quality some of them got lost a little um, this is just an outdoor shower uh, some clients wanted and and uh, they were super happy with it I, th I thought it was nice and the thing with the doing an outdoor shower is you got to really make sure there's no like pokey things because if you're naked in a shower you don't want to be stabbing yourself and bleeding and this was for a hair salon and and it was kind of cool because I did all these cutouts there was actually like four panels two on each side so it kind of obstructed the view from you know the waiting area to the working area but but then I took all those little cutouts and I made doors for them also and that's uh, stainless so those that was kind of a, a cool look for that hair salon um, this I actually did for my dad's house he's got some courtyard and then a garage on the other side with I don't know why you would put a window there but this is kind of like you can see through it but it kind of obscures so the nice thing about doing metalwork is you can just do so many things with it and and when you start doing it then you're like looking at welds and seeing if anything looks good or not and I mean even I was looking at city buses like looking at the welds on a city bus just because you know it's like oh cool it's metal so um, this is another screen that I'd done and it kind of obscures the view to the to the backyard and I don't know if you can really tell but they're kind of they kind of go at an angle and that's uh, copper and steel I believe if I recall correctly and then you can kind of torch copper and it comes all these really cool colors and um, there's a piece that I did in the gallery where I've torched the copper and and copper just takes heat in all kinds of crazy ways so it looks cool so this is this is another early screen that I did and again you can see that it's like the three panels but it's just like self-adjusting and and uh, it's kind of a fun piece it, it sold years ago but but I don't know 
it just, it was kind of fun at the time, and I have an oxyacetylene, and so these little swirly, circly things, all those were done with the oxyacetylene. And it's, it's kind of fun to learn how to do oxyacetylene because what there's to know about that is if you want something to bend like here, you have to put the heat here. You can't be like bending here and imagining it's, or heat here and imagine it's gonna bend over here. So it's, it's kind of a mindset that you have to get into, but kind of once you get the hang of it, it's really a lot of fun. Um, this was, I made the mailbox and the screen door for another gal. She lived on Tulip Street, so it's kind of literal, but that's what she wanted. Um, this is another kind of cool screen door I did for that one of the early pictures that I showed with the big boulders and me and my dog. I made, a, I don't know, three or four gates for their house that, that had more glass incorporated into it. And then what's holding the chunks of glass is um, some thinner copper. So copper kind of lends itself well to that too, that you can wrap it around things. It's, it's easy to work with. And this, I did some early uh, water fountains. And this was my photographer friend, Anthony Scoggins, too. We went out to the desert, and we were waiting for the sun to go down, and it was just calm as anything. And then as soon as the sun goes down, the wind started blowing like you wouldn't believe. And it's like all we could do to get this picture without it blowing over. And that is not actually water. We used um, tape clear packing tape. You can use clear packing tape and magically it looks like water. So, and that basin that's supposedly holding the fictitious water is copper also. And, and in real, it really did hold water and it really did work, but just for purposes of the photo uh, and, and the fact that we are out in the desert without a generator. And that's another one. So that's also just clear packing tape. And this is a kind of a cool fountain I did for um, some clients. And what this does, it's, it's kind of hard to see, but it kind of swirls around only on the right-hand side. And then it, it hits this plate and goes down. And they had already had that, that, um, that thing plumbed, the brick thing plumbed, and they already had their little pool and everything. So, um, and they were really impressed with it and it came out really beautifully and you couldn't see like any of the plumbing. It just like magically the water came out. And, and um, what was also kind of fun about this, it's good to know, is, is I had, I could have put it in the back of the truck any way I wanted to, but I purposely put it in the back of the truck so that when they looked in the back of the truck, they'd be like, oh my God, this looks so cool. So, so, you know, that's just something to learn, too. If you're delivering something like that little wow factor first impressions thing. But for working with clients, I mean, I don't think anything I've shown so far, but like if you're working on a really extensive project, I like to check in with the client during the project, like if there's any questions, so you don't have like any freakish surprises. Um, this was a super beautiful piece. If this is copper. We took the photo down by the ocean. It went in um, a couple's backyard. And you can't really tell, but what I'd done, it's all hammered out copper and swirled around. And then I had it powder coated. And I used a, a special kind of soldering that can take high heat. But the cool thing is if you put clear powder coating on copper, it, powder coating is where like they would do like a mailbox where they, they, you have a piece of metal and you put electrodes to it and you spray like powdered paint on it and it gets super hot and just somehow binds to the, to the metal, the paint does. So, and they can, it can come in any color you want or clear. And when you put clear powder coat on copper, it comes out this like really crazy like yellowy, greeny color. And if there's any imperfections, you get like other funky things that happen. It's very cool. So, and the height on this thing, like the tallest piece, I want to say is about four and a half. So it wasn't like a really super tall piece, but it just, it, it fit really nicely in their courtyard. Um, 
this is all aluminum, and I did this for uh, some people that were doing trade shows. And so they just gave me like boxes of this stuff that they use for their trade shows for setting up their booths. And, and, um, and so I welded that together for them, and then that was like in their showroom or something like that, and it kind of like pointed people in the direction of, you know, I don't know, their display booths or something. But, um, but the thing to know about aluminum is you got to have a little thing in your mind that says, okay, pull back and wait a minute. Because aluminum, you think everything is going great, and then the next thing you blow a hole in it. So it, it holds heat in a, in a weird way. It's a weird, aluminum's like a really weird thing. So I've, I've used it, but it's, it's very odd. I've, I've never really quite figured it out. I had clients that um, had a uh, car dealership, a BMW dealership, and they raced cars, not necessarily their BMWs, but, but I made um, four bar chairs for them. And so these are all Harley Davidson parts. And then the leather is like, it's kind of fringed on the bottom, but, but I attached all the, the leather fringy thing and you know, put it all together and it's on wheels, so they loved it. So that's, and that's just a different view of it. And for this, for my clients, I did, I made like a little itty bitty maquette just so they could kind of see what we're talking about and, you know, make suggestions of, you know, how they wanted it. So, and this, this was a piece that I did for a show a long time ago. It's all um, steel and then I welded the solid pieces I welded on the sides and ground it all down really nice. And it was funny because when we were taking the picture of this, I'm like literally right outside the picture, like ready to catch these suckers because they're going to like fall off of this rock that it was on. So it makes a nice photo, but, but you know, it's kind of all that behind the scenes stuff that you're like sweating bullets that it doesn't like take a plunge off the cliff. Um, so this starts, I have a couple of pictures of these urban trees and... Um, and this was this is called Lizardo. Let me see. Okay. Let's see, I didn't want this to happen and now I'm lost. Hmm. Well, I don't know. Anyways, this um, this is called Lizardo. It was part of this urban tree thing that the Port of San Diego did. And um, so they had 30, they would select 30 different artists and probably about, I don't know, 100 something people applied to it. And you make like a little maquette and you submit it and they, and they select. So I had done this with a friend of mine that does ceramics. And, and so all the little colored things are ceramics. And he, I had made the basic outline of it and then I screwed holes and then screwed holes in this in this like flat bar here I would screw a hole and he would fit his ceramic piece in and then we make a little hole in the ceramic and then that kind of putty that dries hard I would I put a screw in the putty and just enough to get the threading and then back the screw back out and then he finished the ceramics so basically the ceramics are all totally locked in if that makes any sense if it doesn't make sense you can ask me about it later and I'll try to make it more, make more sense. Oh, that's what I forgot to say. When I was getting started too, the other things that, that is important to mention, oh yeah, man, I skipped over all this stuff, um, is um, when I got started, I had a, a good friend that was an attorney and I would actually do babysitting for her in exchange for her making a contracts for me. So she made me a really nice contract, a business contract that basically said, you know, if I have a problem with a client that it can go into mediation and we can discuss the problem. Because I've never been sued, I've never wanted to get sued. And it's like, my feeling is if you approach a client and be professional in the first place and have a contract that you both sign and say, this is my expectations, and, and you know what I mean, you just, it's like you have an open discussion about who, what your expectations are and what they expect from you. And then you agree on a price and always what I've done 
is I will get the half up front and then half when it's finished. And I keep referring to this. Um, what I should say is when I was in San Diego for like, I don't know, 25-ish years, I was just hardcore like one client after the next, like boom, boom, boom. So, so that's why like something like a contract comes in handy. We moved, my husband and I moved here a little over 10 years ago and I still do stuff for clients, but I do more like art, art for myself now. So actually what you see reflected in that in the gallery is more my own art. So it was kind of nice once we moved here to kind of find my own voice of what I wanted to make. But something like this, the urban tree thing, is something that I wanted to make. It's not like particularly for a client. And something like this is like you're, you're applying, you're trying to make something that a lot of people are gonna enjoy, but you still need to enjoy it yourself. Because at the end of the day, you might have like this giant chameleon that you have nothing to do with. So, but I, but I love them anyway. So, and this ultimately ended up in my bat, dad's backyard because he loved it, so. Um, this was another urban tree. This thing was, uh, I think it came out to probably shy of 20 feet, but it was in front of the cruise ship terminal. So that's what, that explains kind of all that crappy fence that you're looking at, but you know, can't be helped. So, and then um, I was telling Jill that what they were doing for these urban trees, these big cement planters, is um, a company makes those so, and typically you'd put them in front of a, a, a business so that a car doesn't drive into the business. So, um, but for here, they worked out very well to hold these, these urban trees. And then what they would do is just supply us with poles. So like the poles, I think they were like about, I don't know, six or, six or eight inches in diameter and maybe about 10 or 12 feet tall. And actually, Cecilia Stanford, which is here somewhere, we first met doing these urban trees. So she has done this as well. And now she's in Silver City also. So um, let's see. Let's, this was another urban tree. Um, and what this is is copper and stainless steel. And what I've done here is it's kind of, let's see, there's another picture. You can kind of see it more close up. But the copper and the stainless steel are all layered, and it kind of goes back at an angle. So all this area over here is hollow. And then you see this nice texture here, which kind of either looks like water or bark or something. And I don't have a picture of it, but the most horrifying thing is when they install these things, they have a giant crane, and they're aiming for the, the um, hole in the bottom of this planter deal. And you literally like see your sculpture flying through air and you're like, oh my God, I hope this doesn't fall. So, um, but again, I did that like, I don't know, seven out of nine years or something like that, that they had it. So, um, and then this piece, ultimately it sat in my driveway and ruined part of my driveway. It sat there for about five years because it's crazy heavy. And then um, a theater bought it and then it was out in front of a theater. So it was kind of nice. I was happy that it left my driveway. And then this piece uh, is another urban tree that I had done. And this was actually a real learning experience for me. It's a rolling ball sculpture. And it has a crank on the side. And now it doesn't have the chain. But it had a chain. And it takes balls up to the top. And then it had a little splitter so it could go down different ways. And, and, you know, the balls roll around in it. So it's kind of a fun piece. It's got a lot of personality. It's called Rolling Wilbur. And uh, my dad very kindly cut out all the wood pieces for it. And then this is actually a U-channel that I had some guys bend for me. And um, the guys that were bending for me, the one guy that ran the place was really nice, and some of the other workers were kind of jerks. But, but, you know, it's like some people, they can't ever get over the fact that you're an artist. So you're always going to be like this artsy-fartsy 
I don't know, whatever. But, but you're going to hear, like if you're a woman doing metalwork, you're going to hear sexist comments. You cannot get away from it. But the way I prefer to look at it is just the guys are jealous. It's like if they could do that, they would, but they can't. So they're just going to be <laughs> snotty and say bad things to me about it. So, um, and now, I, let's see. This is um, a table that was actually about 10 feet long in this home in Coronado. And it's kind of like, it's not really an island, but it's a really nice place in San Diego. This table is about 10 feet long. And it's, it's um, stone on the top. I think it's granite. And then it splits in the middle, and it has glass coming through it. And then all this cast glass here. And then there's a little piece of cast glass there. So I like figuring out logistics of how to make something. And this was really tricky to make, really tricky to install. Gorgeous, because you kind of walk in the front door, and then the water is kind of past that entry hall. And, um, and then they ended up moving to another house, so I got the opportunity to uninstall it and reinstall it. So, um, but, but what I did for this when I was making the proposal for the clients is I actually made like a little tiny thing out of some very firm paper that explained it, like made like this cute little table thing to show them. But um, I was really super happy with the way that came out. So cast glass, I don't know a lot about how they do it, but they like have different shapes in sand or something, and then they heat it up, and it takes the form. And then this chair also was for the same clients. So you can kind of see it a little better here. But what I've done is this piece is more solid, and then I have a lip back here, and then um, use some kind of a clear adhesive all around this lip to hold the glass onto the chair. And then there's this little bitty glass part here. And, and actually, it's actually very comfortable because I hate like some fancy chair that you can't sit in. So, um, so they were happy with it. I was happy with it. This is a water fountain. I ended up making two of them because they ended up buying a second home. And they liked it. And the thing, it's all copper, and it spins around different directions. And, and they have this big, uh, I want to say it's like 8 or 10 feet diameter water container thing. And the good thing about that is, is it's, it's big, but you got to have chlorine. And you have chlorine splashing around, and you're going to kill all the plants. So you actually need the water big enough. Oh my god, i got to speed this up. Sorry. Here's another fountain that I did. Um, Stainless steel, that ball is about 400 pounds. This is another gate that was kind of cool, copper and steel. Sorry, I'm like scooting right through this because I realize I'm talking too much. This is a gate I did for an elementary school that I did w collaboration with a friend. This is another um, gate, another home that kind of came out nice, kind of an Asian feel to it. This I did for an elementary school. I loved this because the kids were like fifth and sixth grade after school art class. And, and this is all children's art. And then the ones that didn't do that, there's a bunch of children's art in this tree. And then the kid that made that, um, I had them all write their names next to their artwork so they could take credit for it. And at the end of the day, when I was done installing it, the little kid that did that, and this is in Oakland, California, a really rough neighborhood. There's only one little kid standing behind me with this cute little backpack, and he's like, I can't believe I'm up there. And he was the one that his name is right underneath the school sign. And um, it was like, I just, it broke my heart. I was like, I'd make 100 of these for free just to hear that again. Because he complimented me, and nobody told him to do it. And, and I just... Sweetest kid. So anyways, this is, I made three gates for, for this Konakai Marina. It's like a high-end marina in San Diego. Um, it's 18 feet tall by 18 feet wide. It's all marine grade stainless with just a little bit of copper for the sign. And then I made 200 feet of hand railing to go with the gates um, on, on the three different docks. 
This is called um, Mermaids in a Seashell. This is the biggest job I ever did when I first initially met the client. Straight out, he's like, I don't give a shit about art. I'm going with you because you were the first person that responded to my phone call. <laughs> and, and I'm like, OK, well, we're getting off to a good start. So we're walking along the marina. And I was like, so do we have a theme we want to work with? Maybe cowboys and Indians? Because I'm like, you be a jerk, I'll be a jerk back. And, and, um, but anyway, so we ended up with, with mermaids in a seashell. So I came up with a design over a weekend. And then the gate, the gate walk part is this part right here. And, and this whole entire project uh, took me a year to install. Or, well, actually to make. I did it all in different pieces. And then, you know, slowly the whole project was done after a year. And it's, it, the design is on both sides. So this I used like flat bar and then also um, sheet metal. And when I did the original um, proposal for the client, I did like a full size area just like that. Like made all that, but just made it out of steel. And the reason why I did that is because he was a tough nut. And I just, I'm like, I'm getting this job and I'm going to make it full size. So, um, and then at the very last, the very last, I got my paycheck. I was, and he didn't ever say too much to me. I'm walking past his office and I hear him mumbling something. And I'm like, I got to know what this is. So I'm like backing up and he's like, job well done. That's all he said to me. So I'm like, OK, thank you, bye. <laughs> so and then this gate, uh, there were some other people that were going to their boat at the marina. I ended up making a gate for them. Uh, this hand railing, this, yeah, I, I like it OK. These, this client was extremely complicated. This, this was so cool. I just love, love this hand railing. It went down and made a little hairpin turn and went downstairs. And the story to say about this is I actually slightly caught her house on fire. She was, she was gone for the day, so I was there by myself. My husband, Rudolph, goes out and gets lunch. I'm there by myself. I'm up on one of these upper steps, and I see like this little spark shoot off. But I didn't really think about it. And then all of a sudden, like there's this wall of flame. And I'm like, oh, good God. And that's real. That is real. And, and I, my welder was on the, the landing, and, and I saw that, and I saw my fire blankets, which actually weren't where they were supposed to be. And I went down, and I'm like, I will throw myself on these flames and put them out before I burn this woman's house down. So I'm like stomping and everything, and I put it out. And then there was some smoke on the walls. So then I talked to her that evening, and none of you know her, so I can just say this. Um, and I was like real casual. I'm like, yeah, there's a little smoke on the walls, but it's totally normal. So, and then she, and then she's, she's like, oh, it's okay, because I was going to paint anyway. So, um, this home right here, this is a penthouse condo. Uh, it was like, I want to say it's about 60 feet, and none of it repeats. And the neat thing about that is when you're doing something like that, you got to take into account that gap so that when you see a swirl, it continues. And that's just kind of a close-up of that. Um, I started doing car hoods. These are, these are uh, from a junkyard. And this was inspired by, I was supposed to be in a book club, which I hated. And I was supposed to be reading a stupid book. And I'm looking at a wall instead. And I came up with this car hood stuff. So this will, you'll see over in the gallery. This is also over in the gallery. So these are, again, used car hoods. When you cut them, the, just the heat makes different edges. And it all has to do with the kind of paint and the wax and I don't know, whatever else is on there. So these are a few more things I did. I, these were at A Space here in town. Um, this is my chili pepper that's over at the library. This is about uh, eight different red car hoods and then several more black ones for the top and it's bronze and and conveniently it has wheels i wouldn't suggest going over and rolling it around but it's easy to move and then this i loved because this was in my studio while i was making it so this was 
before things got attached. So it looks kind of like a little pirate hanging from the ceiling. And then some of these are going to be over in the show. Um, this is uh, used bicycle inner tubes that I got a lot of them here in town at Twin Sister Cycles from AJ and previously Annie. And then um, bronze that I've done in the class with Michael Medcalf here at the university, the art class, that they do bronze casting every semester. And this was the original drawing for this. So, you know, kind of looks the same, maybe. And if you've ever seen the movie Sing, I, I tell you right now, I totally lifted that off of the monkey's face. I love it. And so I had to use it. This is what I do for the, for the sculpture pieces. This is the bear how he came out, but this is, this is the infrastructure for it. So, so that gives me my initial shape, and then this is wax here. That's, that's the beginning of the process for doing the bronze, and then the little face is just kind of mocked up, but then you can kind of see where I start with on those things. So that's a little bear. This is a couple other things that I have in my yard that are um, too big to bring in. That's bronze from the class. And that's another sculpture piece that I like. Sculpture looks really great in snow. This is a piece. These are all heavier than you would ever want to know about. Um, when I, we loaded these things onto the back of my truck, when they were done, they're aluminum, which you would think aluminum would be light, but it's not. Um, and each one of these pieces was in the back of my truck. And literally, I tied it to the front of the Airstream, and I drove forward and just had them like fall on the ground because they're ridiculous heavy. But they kind of came out cool. They um, are planted in the yard, not moving anywhere, and they look awesome in snow. And, and now this, originally, you can't really see too much rust because this picture was taken early on. But now they got like really cool rust on them. If you ever want anything to rust quickly, let snow sit on it. It's, it works like a dream. And then this is the last piece I want to show you that Denise Fredericks keeps wanting to take from me, but she can't have it yet. So this is, I did this in class. This is just bronze and steel. And um, I'll tell you, let's see. The other things people ask me is my inspiration for art. Um, Sometimes looking at other art, looking at movies. I like um, things in nature. And um, there's some big dragons over there in the gallery. And that is from a, a 15th century Ming dynasty carpet that sold for $7.6 million. And my husband was showing me this on the internet like a year plus ago. And I was like, oh my god, well, that would make a cool sculpture. So that's how that ended up. But um, I just want to speed ahead here to, well, not that far ahead. But um, just one second. I just wanted to share with, with like the students here the things that I wanted to share with everybody, really, is, is the things that I have learned over my career is that um, when Clients, when you're interacting with clients, it's really important to show up on time. I've had clients tell me, like, I work with hundreds of people. They had a big res restaurant chain. They're like, you're the only person that shows up on time. So that's super important. It makes a good impression. Um, do what you say you're going to do on the time you're going to do it. Um, pick your galleries wisely. Deal with the gallery that you like to interact with the person because it is business. It's not just fluffy art stuff. You have to like them and, and um, you know, make a contract if you want to. But you have to approach it as a business if you want to um, succeed as an artist. Um, you can always say no to projects. I've said no to... There were some people that wanted me to do little designs so they could send them to China and then come back and send like make like thousands of them for the US. And I'm like, no, because that undercuts every other artist that I'm trying to support. Um, 
Another client was some big shot architect, wanted me to do a metal base for a table that came down to an itty bitty point and have a giant piece of glass on the top. I'm like, I ain't doing that because that slides off and kills somebody. It's my responsibility. Um, so if a project doesn't feel right for any other reason, don't do it. Um, there's, uh, let's see. When I'm working, this is just for me, but I just don't want to listen to any music or anything. I just like laser focus, and I'm usually about like five steps ahead, and I just want to focus and do it. Um, let's see, some, some other times you maybe have like some idea in the back of your mind, and it just kind of has to cook for a while, but eventually it'll work out. And also to be positive when you're working, because if you're in a bad headspace, you're not going to be very creative. So um, with that, I want to thank Edwina and Charles Milner for the opportunity to be in the Women in Arts lec Lecture Series, thanking Jill Wilburn, or Winburn, who's right here, gallery director, also at the gallery, Ashley, Kat, Kate, and Charlie. Thank you to Michael Medcalf, um, who teaches the sculpture class at the university. If you haven't ever taken his class, you'd love it. And he also has a really big trailer. If you're really nice, he can, you can borrow it. Um, thank you to Colette, Chelsea, and Maurice, especially, who now work at Made in Silver City. Um, also, thank you to everybody else that's been in the art class who's been super helpful over the years. Uh, thank you to Kenyon McNeil, who helped me actually weld the dragon that you'll see over in the gallery. That's the first and only ever time I've ever hired a welder to help me. And I only did it because he's actually a certified welder. And also, I would have never got it done in time. Um, thank you to Jean Robert at A-Space, who shows my work here in town. And also, thank you to my husband, Rudolph, who we've been together for almost 20 years. And he's my number one helper. And he also calls me the welding queen, which you don't need to call me that, but he does. <laughs> and thank you to you guys. I know it's an opening football uh, game tonight. So for any of you, maybe you can whiz home and catch the second half, maybe. So um, thank you, thank you. You've been a good audience. I don't, maybe five minutes for questions if you have. Chala? stuff the whole time, but it was like I tried everything else that I thought I would be interested in because I really tried not to be an artist. I really fought it for a lot of years. And then when I had that light bulb moment, it's like, son of a bitch, I got to be a welder. It was like it just hit me that strong that this is my career path. But then once I found that career path, it's always like you're kind of honing it in to like, figure out who your clients are, what you like to do, you know, making that match happen. And, and so it's always still a learning process. And the other cool thing that I forgot to mention, I met a guy years ago um, who has done welding for the San Diego Zoo for 30 years. And he said, you're always learning something. And the thing is with welding is you are always learning something. And there, it's such a giving um, community of people who share ideas. Like, because it's not easy, and when you figure something out, you're like, oh my god, I got to show you this really cool thing, and this is how you do it. And I don't know that it's always like that with other mediums. So um, if you're fortunate enough to land in welding, it's, it's a good career, and it's always a lot of fun. Any other questions?
I usually come up with an idea, and if it's for a client, what I'll do is I'll have like about three different options to say like, you want to spend a lot of money, go with stainless. If you want to spend less, go with steel. So each, each um, metal that you work with, or like if you're working with rubber or anything else, it all has its own kind of characteristics. So you just kind of like pick your project first and then think of what material lends itself to that project and, and what's going to get you to your goal. And also if it's going to be outside or inside, you know, or wind. I mean, there's a lot of like factors you got to think about or if you're making a fountain, like how the thing's going to sound. You know, it's, it, there's, there's a lot that goes into like planning ahead and when you're working with metal it's really better to think ahead with your brain because it's really heavy so you don't you know move stuff around in your head first before you start moving it around in person <laughs> any other questions um originally i had stuff in galleries and i sold stuff through galleries and then made some contacts that way and then a lot of it in San Diego turned out to be word of mouth. And then you apply for something like the Urban Trees and then like tons of people see it. And then you stand out there and, you know, have business cards and stuff and you just kind of, you know, work it. That's, that's all I can say. I mean, if you do like group shows, make some good business cards. I have some plastic ones that are machine washable and people love them. And you just, you're handing out cards like mad. You know, get a, get a website, kind of direct people to that. So there's a lot of different ways to promote yourself. Um, if you're having a show, contact newspapers. Have them take pictures and, you know, do interviews. Does that, does that help answer your question? Okay. Any other in the back? Um, I think steel is the easiest, um, but also, I, you know, they all have their benefits. What I can say is what I like the least is aluminum, just because it's like this freakish thing I've never really understood. It's lightweight, supposedly, but, um, <laughs> but it's just weird. I don't even like really the touch of it, but um, I would say steel, stainless, and, and copper are my favorites. Oh, okay, so good question. She's asking about how I price my work. Originally, I was not charging enough. I kind of got to a point where I'm like, I want to do this as a career, I have to charge more. And so I took some classes to learn how to charge more. Literally, I looked in a mirror, I had to like talk to myself in a mirror, pitch the job to myself, and say this like excruciatingly painful price that I'm like, oh my God, they're just gonna laugh at me. And then I remember the first time I'm telling clients the, the new price, and they totally straight face. They're like, okay, half up front, half when you're done. They didn't even flinch. And I think the thing is, is like people want to tell their friends like, oh, I paid this much and blah, blah, blah. And, and what I realize is, is like, you know, it's not, it's kind of like as an artist, I'm not good at pricing. The other thing is to have a husband who's really good at pricing. So, so we'll come up, I'll come up with one price that's lower, he'll come up with some price that's higher, I'll act like I'm having a heart attack, and then I'll be like, okay, honey, let's do it your way. So, yeah. It's not easy. It is not easy to price your work. Because if something comes easy to you, it's easy to lowball it, you know. But what you got to realize is that you can do stuff that other people can't do. You know, and I guess that's kind of... Like, but you got to remind yourself. Any other questions? In uh huh. In is this here in this piece? Um, this is this is all steel here. That's steel. Steel base. It looks different because it's just starting to get a, like a light rust on it. So that's just the only reason that it looks a little different. 
The only thing that's bronze is this, this, and that, that piece up there. Uh, no. <laughs> if I named it, I don't remember what I named it. <laughs> no, I don't think I did. I know, and Michael Medcalf doesn't want to hear that because you're supposed to name things, but it sits in my yard, so I haven't named it, no. Sorry. Any, any other question back? Um, it's easier not to make mistakes in the first place. I have made, my worst mistake I think was about $300. And, and that's, I categorize mistakes by dollars that come out of my pocket. Um, it's easier, I say, I'd rather make it right the first time because if you have a mistake somewhere in it and you leave it there, then you're always trying to hide it somehow. And then you're changing your design based on some mistake that either you should have fixed it or never had it in the first place. So I, you know, I mean, you're gonna make mistakes, that's just kind of life, but they're never fun. And, and I think in hindsight, if you just like fix a mistake in the first place, you spend, you're happier in the end, and you didn't spend like a lot of extra time trying to disguise it somehow, some other way. So, other? Question something? Yes? Yes? Of San Diego? Oh boy. I don't know. I loved it all. I loved it all. And then we started traveling and then and then once we got out of San Diego, just kind of realized there's a whole nother world. And and it was kind of just nice to get out on the road and not see so many people. What I like here is is my brain works better. I don't have like a lot of logistics of when to go on what freeway at what time. Uh, like in San Diego, I mean, you got that wired. Like, okay, I go here at this time, miss that. And, and here it's just like, you know, I don't even care. Like I just know it takes me 20 minutes to get from here to there and it's pretty reliable. So um, it's, I like the way my brain works here a lot better. We go back to visit because, you know, we have some family there, but I love it here. So, but I love San Diego too. It's not like I don't like it. It's just that I think for us, we needed a change. You know, need a little more space. I don't know, just a good change. Any other questions? Okay, so um, go over and enjoy the gallery and I'll see you over there. Thank you, Linda. <laughs> you did great. You did great. Thank you. <laughs> Um, go ahead and go up to the gallery. It should be open, waiting for you. There's some, some um, snacks for you. And also, I want to apologize to everyone that went to Parodi Hall. There was a little bit of a misunderstanding with that. Um, next time, we'll make sure we have plenty of signage out there so you know to come here, unless something changes. But the next show will be here as well. Oh, yeah, gallery hours. The gallery hours were closed on Monday and were Tuesday through Friday, 10 to 4. This show is up until October 6th.